Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining. Sorry about the delay. We had a tech issue, but we are here and we are going strong. And we have an amazing show for you today, really jam-packed. Uh, we have three parts of the show. The first part of our show, we're going to be speaking to two Arab Americans about Joe Biden's prospects in the presidential election, how his support of genocide is having an impact on his prospects. Then I am going to play an interview I did with journalist Max Blumenthal, and then after that, I'm going to be talking to Matt Lieb and Daniel Mate. Matt Lieb is the uh, host of the podcast, Bad Hasbara. Daniel Mate is a co-host of that podcast and also a musical uh, theater lyricist. And he co-wrote that uh, parody cover song that I did, um, Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now, about BB and Biden. So... Um, Let's see. Before I start, we're going to start really soon, but make sure you like the stream. Please subscribe. Please become Patreon supporters if you can. Patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. You're definitely going to want to because I'm playing about half an hour of my interview with Max, but I have half an hour of an additional interview with Max where he gets into the a lot of October 7th um, allegations and gets into which ones are true and which ones are not true. And he's been really smeared for that. So you're definitely going to want to see that. And um yeah, give it a thumbs up. And I'm going to bring in um, our first two guests. And those guests are uh, Layla Alabad, who is a regional organizer with We the People in Southeast Michigan. She's a proud daughter of Palestinian immigrants, number 12 of her 14 brothers and sisters, and mother of three fierce future social justice warriors. Layla has been a longtime advocate for intimate partner violence and sexual assault prevention, environmental justice issues, voter. Sorry, whoops. Uh, uh, voter rights and movements that amplify justice and the voices of black and brown communities. She continues to engage the collective power of her ancestral roots and her learning to shift and empower marginalized communities for equitable, sustainable change. We are also bringing on Say uh, Saba Syed, who is a student at Michigan State. Uh, she is a Palestinian American and she is the head of the Arab Culture Association at her school. And she was also uh, on Face the Nation recently, where she was asked if she would be voting for Joe Biden. So welcome, Layla and Saba. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. You? I'm good. How are you? Good. Saba, explain to us where you're joining us from, because you have an interesting background happening right now. Oh, yeah. So as of right now, this might have to switch to a setting. But as of right now, I'm in this McDonald's randomly. And I'm not buying anything. I didn't buy anything. Support the boycott. But because um, the Sterling Heights, which is like an hour and a half from where I live, they're having their city council. And they've been, the constituents of like Sterling Heights have been asking for a ceasefire resolution. They keep denying them. But one of the councilmen, Mr. Councilman Mike, he decided to retweet my video a lot of the times saying so many things. And then first was saying like, this is the dumbest thing. What is my timeline? And then the other thing was that he said, these people are ushering their doom. And it was like, again, the picture, it was the video retweeting of me and Thassen, who's my co-panelist on Face the Nation. And I'm like, sir, maybe focus on what your constituents wants and get off Twitter and people won't be mad. Nice, but, so you're gonna speak truth to power to him tonight? Yeah, somebody, um, this one girl, she reached out to me and she said, hey, like, I think it would be like very powerful if you were to come to say it, because I was going to speak on your behalf on this. But if you can make it. And yeah, I forgot that it was today. And that's oh, okay. Yeah. No, so let's play this video that uh, caused such a firestorm of you on Face the Nation. Saba, you said reproductive rights are a huge factor for you, but that you probably won't vote for President Biden. I think it would be hypocritical of me to use reproductive rights as a way to justify voting for Biden when Biden is aiding and sending military aid to Israel, which is airstriking Gaza and blocking humanitarian aids, leading to women there who are pregnant, um, either getting C-sections without anesthesia, not being able to be provided with prenatal. 
Natal care. Okay, so that is a very strong statement, and we're going to be talking about that in a second. But Layla, what is your role in this discussion that we're having tonight? Yeah, um, I'm here tonight um, as the campaign campaign manager for the Listen to Michigan Uncommitted Vote campaign, um, and this is our um, this is a strategy that a very grassroots strategy. Um, of Michigan uh, community organizers saying that we are going to be voting uncommitted in the Democratic election on February 27th. And so I'd ask both of you, what is it that's motivating you? Uh, Saba, you, you started to talk about this, but tell us more about why you are either uncommitted or not going to vote for Biden. Um, I think that for my answer, depending on which crowd's listening, there's two parts to my answer where it's me as a Palestinian um, that is living here and has the privilege of living here. And the only thing that's differentiating me from my other Palestinians that are in Gaza right now is just my location. It is my duty to speak out about it. I think it's my responsibility and it's not, I always say it's not to be applauded, it's to be expected. Um, and another thing is that fact that I am also an American citizen in this country and somebody who's taken AP U.S. history and I've taken eighth grade social studies where they hounded us with our Bill of Rights, our constitution and how we're the great nation that I think that we need to be upholding that constitution democracy, especially when we as a country were established on a genocide that we still kind of refuse to acknowledge uh, fully. And it's still controversial to acknowledge the fact that we were built on slavery and segregation and discrimination in the name of a democracy. And we go to other places claiming that we're helping them out because they're so savages and whatnot. So I think that as an American, it's also my duty to make sure that those running in office don't, they practice what they preach because if we're gonna be the greatest country of them all, we need to be actually doing that, you know? Actions speak louder than words. So I think that it's every American's responsibility, actually, to call out our politicians. Um, but yeah. And Leila, tell us more about this initiative, this project that you're launching, what it's going to be doing. Yeah. So with this, um, collect because really it is a collective effort. There's no brand. There's no um, one organization affiliated um, with uh, Listen to Michigan because it is such a, um, it's such a, it's something, it's an action that resonates with so many um, folks from uh, the Arab American community, the Muslim American community, but also the anti-war and pro-ceasefire voters. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a collective effort of all these amazing organizers and we have support from uh, local and uh, national um, organizations, as well as our electeds, you know, our, um, our uh, Mayor Abdullah Hamoud is 100% supportive of the efforts of Listen, uh, Listen to Michigan and the uncommitted vote. Um, and, you know, right now, President Joe Biden, he is not representing the 80% of Democrats who want a ceasefire, or the Muslim Arabs and young people who don't want to put who put him in office in 2020, because it was largely the Arab American Muslim vote that got Joe Biden to win his election in 2020 in Michigan. Um, we are now out protesting his policies in the streets. He has broken uh, a fundamental trust and no amount of lecturing about the greater evil, the lesser of greater evils um, in 2024 will repair that. So I'm going to ask you about that because you're, you, I'm sure you get this all the time, right? That, oh, you're yeah. enabling Trump. Trump's a fascist. Trump is worse than Biden. Biden's bad, but it's going to be worse under Trump. Mm -hmm. So what's your guys' response to that? Well, we're aware, well aware that Trump is not our friend. There is a long time between now and November for Biden to change his policy and possibly earn support from voters. But Time is running out and Biden's funding of Netanyahu's war makes a mockery of the president that claimed to fight authoritarianism and for democracy um, when Trump was in office. You know, he made a lot of promises during his campaign trail and, you know, he promised that he was his president presidency was going to be rooted in humanitarian politics and he has completely abandoned that. Um, and, you know, we have 80% of uh, Democratic voters who 
uh, support a ceasefire to back that up. And what would he need to do to earn your votes and the votes of others? You know, the very bare minimum to even begin talking about what support from the Arab American community, the Muslim American community, and the pro ceasefire community, just to have those discussions um, minimum would to be to support a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and to reevaluate his policy around um, military funding to Israel. Um, and we make no promises, but this is this would be a start to right. to gain our trust. And what about you, Saba? Um, I kind of will like answer that like whole thing. Um, first, for Joe Biden to win my vote, I think that. It's going to be hard um, as long as, I mean, the only thing, a permanent and immediate ceasefire is kind of what's expected right now. I'm not going to be voting like that's not just going to solve everything. And I think that um, that military aid that is going to Israel, if you're going to acknowledge Israel and the fact that you were helping them in the right, you know, to defend themselves and under that premise of you trying to make sure everything is peace and good using that same money when you do call for um, a permanent ceasefire into fixing the damages that we got caused in Gaza and ensuring that the siege is lifted on it. And then also, actually, I don't think that he should be running again. I mean, he did violate the constitution, no consequences there. So actually initiating those steps and then stepping away to let somebody else, um, because that's like, at some point you messed up too much you need to pay you need to be you need to pay for the mur like genocide joke you've murdered over thirty thousand people and you don't get just like a good job now you're doing a ceasefire um i think that i've gotten a lot of the comments about trump as well and it's um it's baffling to me because a lot of the comments are like well have fun when he bans um muslims Sir, so you're basically telling me that I have to choose between a president that violated the Constitution and another president that is saying publicly that he will be violating the First Amendment right, your freedom of religion. And then um, a lot of the people were making a comment about reproductive rights as well. Like, we'll have fun with Trump with doing that. Like, also, again, um, that's we should not be encouraging the less evil that they so blatantly saying they're going to not uphold the values of this country. Um, what I do hope that people kind of get from what I said is that, hey, you need to start acting now. You need to start being more aware of your surrounding and that your advocacy or your call for human rights actually extends to all humans. It does and what, not mean. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It yeah, does, does not, not mean just what? mean it does not just mean like here within the U.S. Right. Right. I, I, I thought it was great when you brought up reproductive rights, because I think for some people, their feminism like ends at the border and that's not real feminism or human rights. Um, what what is it that you're saying violated the Constitution? When um, I'm not fully like knowledge, knowledge on like the details of it. But when Joe Biden bombed Yemen without the approval of ah, Congress, right. that is a yeah. big no, no. Um, right. And exactly, yeah. I'm not sure if surpassing Congress for more aid is just like a law or it's more in the Constitution that you can do that. But I'm pretty sure, based on my knowledge in eighth grade U.S. history and whatever, the point of the point of it is to have we shouldn't have a central power, and that's why we have the checks and balances system because we were so afraid of a central power, but seems as if right now it's Joe Biden's word. Right. And is that not a central government in a sense? Um, right. He's they, taking, he's, he's yeah. saying that he can do things without seeking congressional approval. And it's interesting because yeah. there's certain things he pretends that he'd love to do, but can't without congressional approval. And then he doesn't do them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Layla, I know you have to run off and thank you for your time. I know how busy you are. Any final words that you want to share? Also would love to hear briefly about your family's experience in Palestine and if you still have family yeah. there where you were born. Yeah, I, I have know. I have my whole um on my mother's side, my whole family is is there um in occupied West Bank. 
Um, and actually, my mom was in Palestine. She was in Palestine uh, visiting her family when during October when this all happened. Um, and so it was, you know, I, I felt stressed. I, you know, said today, like, I've never watched Al Jazeera more in my life than I did during that time. Um, and I, I just remember every day just this, this worrisome and, you know, uh, just really worried for my mom and not really know what was going to happen. And I just can't imagine what it's like every day for our brothers and sisters in Palestine and Palestine and Gaza right now. Um, as they are experiencing a genocide and an apartheid. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think I think Saba had yeah. to run out. I just wa want to make a quick yeah. comment of is that this uncommitted campaign moves across, you know, um, cities and uh, ethnicities, ethnicities, religion. Um, and it's a really a vote for um, humanity. So, you know, Whatever your politics are, if you believe in humanity, then vote uncommitted February 27th in the Michigan Democratic primary. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Anything thank else you. you want to say? No, thank you so much for okay. having me on. And we'll, we'll link to the website. Thank you so much. And and for people who aren't in Michigan, what should they be doing? Yeah. Um, well, there's Sorry. right now, there's a lot of like national talks that we're talking to other um, other states that do have an uncommitted option. Or, you know, there, there are other options and we are actually working um, on what that might look like, how we can connect other states into the uncommitted campaign. So more to come in the future. Great. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. You too. Now, Saba is moving into a car and I'm not sure if she wants to join us again or wrap. Um, let's see. We're going to have to make some, let's see. Uh, and by the way, guys. Well, I'll, 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 I'll yell at some of you guys later. Thanks to everyone for the support. Thanks for the gifts. Saba, give me a thumbs up when you're ready to, to join again. Okay. Saba's back. Great. Let me unmute you. Hello. Okay. Hi again. I'm so sorry. It's probably I hope so McDonald's pays you for this product placement. Look at that. Those two golden arches right behind you. I'm just kidding. We can rotoscope that out. Katie. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah. They offered me a free drink and I said, no. Wow. That is, that is principle. It's like a McFlurry. Yeah. You're a stronger woman than I. Wow, they I offered you a free drink? Wow. Yeah, but I said no. I was strong for the cause. Yeah. And covering them. They don't deserve this. Boycott McDonald's. Yeah. And I know you have to get to your meeting to, and and definitely, I hope someone videotapes. Oh, well, how, oh my God, I sound like so old. It's live. I hope someone. Oh, great. So we can play that later. You're, you're speaking to that councilman. But um, any final words before you go off to, to, to speak to your elected officials? Oh, if it's good with you, I can stay on for longer now that I'm like in the oh. car. That was the point of the transition. Got it. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So like if that's good, but if the audio is not good, then feel free to tell no, me. No, it's okay. Right, Brad? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So tell us what else you would like people to know about um, anything that you want to share about how you came to this decision, also your experience in Palestine, because I believe you lived there until you were 10. Yeah, and I visit every summer. Wow. Okay. So what is Yeah, it? I was just there this what, past what? summer, actually. Yeah, sorry. No, 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 no. And how what was it like? And how is your family who's there right now? Um I love going there. I mean, I feel like it's home in a sense. And um I think that I didn't realize what it feels like to like feel like a home till you leave and you're walking there and you just feel like okay this is like my street like my like I know these people um and I think that it might be biased because I'm Palestinian but I think that being Palestinian really allows me to like honor being Arab as well and it makes me proud of it because we are at that risk of we are being actively ethnically cleansed and stuff like that and it's making me want to dig more into my culture and like fight for it so it's make it's growing that like pride in it as well um i mean i loved growing up there i went to a greek orthodox school um so it was always good like celebrating christmas and then the i'm muslim so celebrating eid and seeing the community there um the day that i was born actually is like a very interesting story um it's not interesting it's kind of like it shows you the struggle because to talk about reproductive rights actually and addressing gaza i think that 
a good point to wrap this is that Palestinian women especially actually suffer a lot because of the occupation. I mean, so the day that I my mom went to labor is about 6 a.m. on like April 9th and Ramallah city, which is in the West Bank, technically, if you're going to talk about where Hamas is in Gaza and all of that, let's talk West Bank. Um, it was under siege. So no one was allowed to leave their houses. You're shot if you leave. So my mom started going into like active labor. And so she called her doctor. His name was Yusuf Barghouti. Like he's well known in like the politics of it. And she said that she's going into labor. And it wasn't until 12 hours later that um, that the uh, paramedics were able to get there. And they told my mom, they said, you speak slowly and you come into this and we're going to drive very, very slowly. And they had to be careful when driving not to turn their sirens on or anything. And then luckily enough that the soldiers around the, ha the apartment in which we lived in at the time, my mom lived in at the time, luckily enough, they were on a break to eat lunch or something. And then they, um, she was able to get to the hospital. So to talk about women's rights and reproductive rights extends to all the women in Palestine, whether it's in like the West Bank or even in like Gaza, because to truly believe in reproductive rights is because you believe that the woman should have those guaranteed. And that means any woman of any background of any religion or any affiliation, because it's a moral it's a moral value that you have. It's not a political agenda. It's a moral value with, that affects a human life. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that story. And uh, as people probably know, things like that in terms of checkpoints happens all the time. And people will die because a soldier just doesn't want to let someone through, an ambulance yeah. through. Yeah. No, yeah. That was it was in 2002 so the entire city was on lockdown it wasn't a, like the but there were there is check there were checkpoints after that like when my grandma would come babysit me that she would have to go through it and it it was interesting hearing about it because my mom didn't tell me till my 13th birthday about it which i thought was like hey could have given me that for like a fun fact or something in school icebreakers like way to like save me time on that but yeah any other stories you want to share about your family or about your experience um, in Palestine? I think that, I think something that I understood because I've been doing a lot of work on campus, talking about Palestinian students and advocating for that. And then I passed a resolution within our student government two weeks after um, the October 7th, basically making sure that the university is aware that Islamophobia and anti-Semitism are going to rise, um, that Palestinian students and Arab and Muslims should not be blamed for the action for the group. And that extends to also as well Jewish and Israeli citizens. They should not be blamed for the action of the government. And that bill actually took nine hours to pass. And I was there from 7 p.m. till 4 a.m. And we passed that resolution, which was a big, big step. Um, for us because it hasn't been like it hasn't happened and we got the student government to release a to release a statement as well um but um i think that like see wait i forgot where i was going with how like i've like lost my train of thoughts it's okay because you're literally you're handling a lot and you're literally in a car um no yeah about a route so you may get lost um, Wait, what was the I, question again? So just sorry. about your experiences in Palestine or your family's experiences. And everyone, you're doing great, by the way, in case you're, everyone's in the comments is loving what you're saying. Okay. So, I, yeah, I'm just, I just got a little bit nervous. I got like this, but no, yeah. So a lot of the work like on campus and my advocacy, I remember where I was going with that. So um, obviously I was going to face retaliation. Um, and to me, I... I don't see a point in arguing with somebody that doesn't come to the table with an open mind uh, because I'm not here to debate with you. I'm not here to argue with you. I'm here to make change. And if you're going to waste my time, I don't have to deal with you. You can hate on me all you want. You could yap all you want. But at the end of the day, still don't care. Um, so I think with that, I've spoken to a lot of uh, students that may disagree with me politically, I think. Um, even more pro-Zionism students. I wanted to understand that perspective and the meaning behind it and why what I was saying was so offensive because I think there's nothing wrong in learning. 
and uh, I spoke to a couple of people that grew up in um, Israel, the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, they were sharing kind of what it like is like for them there. And then to me, as a Palestinian whose entire like family lineage, I'm like, I can't blame these people for falling in love with the land. Like going to Palestine, being on the land, you're going to fall in love with it. And I think there's nothing wrong with sharing that and appreciating it um, and honoring it. So that's just kind of like something that, you know, using my stories of growing up there and sharing that with people like and seeing the other perspective, it's like, I don't blame you for wanting to stay. I want to stay too. But here's how we do it like the most, the least harmful way and the most respectful way, because we don't want history repeating itself, I think. And I, um, I do a lot of my work just in hopes that like my family, like back home can see it. I don't send anything to them. I don't tell them. I don't even tell my mom about the face. My mom is here, but I didn't tell my family back home about Face the Nation because it's like, I'll know that I've done good awareness to this is like when they find out, find out about it on their own. Um, because I know they watch the news and they keep up with it. Um, and that's something that like is, I'm hoping one day it will happen. Um, I just always known like since I was very, very, very little, like something in me like was pulling me towards it and like guiding me being like, hey, like you are Palestine, like obviously it matters to you, but it was a deep connection. Like once you're older, something's gonna change you're gonna help make it change and i forgot about that thought up until these past few months when all of this is happening and it seemed as if like i'm very grateful for all the opportunities are like lining up for it um, i know i like went off track to the question oh no, it's great but, like, yeah yeah well well thank you so much for joining we'd love to have you again next time we'll do it where you're in a stable place so yes. the sound is good but yes. i totally understand you're doing important things so and everyone yes. as you'll see when you're watching later the comments are very positive so, so I'm thank glad. you for joining and come back and good luck with uh, speaking truth to that uh, councilman. Thank you. If anyone wants to watch it, it's live streamed on YouTube or you can watch it after. Stay tuned on this show. But <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I'd love to be back when I'm in a stable environment. And I'm very sorry. Like it had to come to this. No, don't apologize at all. This has been great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye, Sava. Bye. Bye. Okay, that was great. All right, guys, don't go anywhere. This show is just, it's, we're going to keep on keeping on because right now uh, I'm going to play an interview that I did with Max Blumenthal. But hold on, Brad, how are we with the likes? And Brad, we got to give our members stuff because we got all these members joining. Next week, we're going to have some new Bodhi emojis. Make sure you become Patreon supporters too, if you can, at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And you're definitely going to want to do that because. Ma my max interview is uh, only half an hour, and there's a whole half an hour or more. I am seeing roughly 900 and change likes, which not is bad, but about not 50, great. 50, I mean, 50%. it's 50. Uh, I'd yeah. like to think that more than half of the people watching. Oh, hey, Rick, glad you're feeling better. I have a friend in the chat who just stopped by, who I'm glad oh, to hear is better. I'm glad he's um, feeling better too. Uh, that's someone's dad, Brad. I don't want to mention the name, but someone very cute. That person I send you photos of all the time. Oh. That's her dad, yeah. Okay. Oh. Um, so uh anyway, guys, uh but 50%, give us a thumbs up. Yeah. But we need to bump it up. What did you say? What's the number? Nine hundred? Uh, now it's about a thousand. I mean, I really should be making you do two thirds, but I'll I'll make it get to eleven 1 hundred, and then we'll keep going. Because if you want to hear from Max Blumenthal, you gotta like it. And I do I have to train you so much that don't you know that you just like the show? That's all you have to do. Don't do it twice because that cancels it. Like I the mean, show. no one no one can accuse you of not being consistent in terms of informing the audience on a regular yeah. basis. I don't berate them always though, but sometimes no. I have to. Especially no. when you got a Max Blumenthal uh, interview to hold hostage. Yeah, but I mean, back when we did like the eight-hour streams, there there was some epic. Uh... Right. <laughs> yeah, you want to see Max? Then like the stream. Where are we at now? Um, one point one k. All right, that's what I said. Oh, you did, yeah. Maybe I'll wow. pause in the middle to see how much. Uh... <laughs> Seriously, maybe I'll find a good spot to pause it. Oh um, boy. And uh, I think we don't need to say anything else without any further ado. 
and yeah, and but and, 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 and yes, I, next week we will have the Bodhi emojis for everyone. Yeah, That's, we'll have Bodhi emojis. Apologies. Uh, and also, don't leave after Max because after Max, we're going to have on Daniel Mate and Matt Lieb. And Matt Lieb does a really funny Bad Hasbara yeah. podcast, and he does these great videos. We'll play some of them where he plays a liberal Zionist, and we're going to be talking about Hasbara, um, and which is Israeli uh, propaganda, and. Um, then also stay to the end because after we wrap, that's when the Max uh, Patreon is going to be live. Yep. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So excited to be talking to Max Blumenthal. He is the founder and editor of The Gray Zone. He's the author of several books, including The Management of Savagery. Welcome, Max. Good to see you. Thank you. You too. Hey. <laughs> um, it's been a while. But wanted to ask you to start off, you have done a lot of really important reporting and you've been smeared, which is always a sign that you're doing something right. But want to start off with your assessment of where we are right now in not only this genocidal war against Gaza, but also this regional war, which the United States government is denying is a regional war and is pretending is like discrete mini wars. Yeah, I... I... <clears throat> take heart in being smeared. It's worse than uh, not being credited for my work by other publications, certain other publications, honestly. It's better to be acknowledged than not, even if it's hatefully done. But yeah, uh, but yeah I mean, we've been covering this war longer than we thought we would have. I mean, I thought the 51 day war in 2014 was insanely long and grueling. And uh, I'm almost, I've almost lost count. It's over 120 days. And it was only a matter of time before the war expanded throughout the region. That's really what's happening. While Tony Blinken has been on, I, I've lost count. I think he might be on his fourth trip to the Middle East now. Um, apparently trying to work out some deal to convince Hezbollah to withdraw some of its forces from south of the, the Litani River in exchange for Israel making huge compromises, which would lead to some of its population maybe being able to go back to the north. But it, it, right at this point, if the war ended, Israel would face a serious political defeat. Of course, it comes at the price of setting Gaza back 20, 25 years. It would take 10 years to rebuild enough housing to house everyone at least. Um, but Israel has made no real military progress in Gaza. Its stated goals were to eradicate Hamas and release the hostages. and They've done neither. Hamas is still causing casualties, destroying Israeli armor with locally made weapons, especially uh, west of Khan Yunus. And they are still even fighting in the north, which has been mostly destroyed, blanketed with tens of thousands of kilotons of <clears throat> Israeli explosives. So uh, this isn't just my assessment. It's retired U.S. General Frank McKenzie, uh, former member of the Joint Chiefs on um, Face the Nation yesterday on CBS, said Israel isn't meeting its goals. It's failed in its goals, and its progress has been very limited. U.S. intelligence estimates Israeli forces have killed about 20 to 30 percent of Hamas fighters since October. That is far short of destroying Hamas. Um, how do you judge the level of success of Israel's campaign? Well, it's very limited so far. You know, I think they set themselves a goal of removing the political echelon and the military leadership e echelon of, uh, of Hamas when they went in. They have not been successful to date at doing either. And in, Hezbollah hasn't even thro thrown anywhere near its full weight into the battle. So where does what can Israel do? And what can the United States do? They can't, if they, they can't agree to a ceasefire politically. There are so many forces that are preventing them from doing it, even though more and more of the Israeli population wants a ceasefire because they realize that getting the hostages out and uh, keeping the troops in Gaza is are mutually exclusive. So what the U.S. is doing is essentially prolonging, buying Israel time by bombing all these popular mobilization units in Iraq, um, attacking 
targets in Syria that they believe are connected to Iran or the IRGC and bombing Yemen, which has intervened and waged basically an actual responsibility to protect military intervention to prevent genocide. Yemen is the Yemen and the Ansar Allah movement, which effectively control it, are the leaders of the genocide prevention movement, not Samantha Power, who's directly implicated in genocide in Gaza. So the US, I mean, what what, what they're doing is completely fruitless militarily. These are like strikes just to demonstrate that Biden is serious, but they're not strikes that take away anything valuable from Iran or any of its allies. They've said they've changed nothing on the ground and Israel is completely trapped and its social crisis is growing. Remember before October 7th, Israel had this gigantic, mostly kind of like middle-class Ashkenazi uh, metropole movement against Netanyahu, but it was ferocious. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people were in the streets at several points. And Netanyahu crushed that movement and got all of the reservists to actually go back to the army reserves after refusing to go to training with October 7th. But now they're back. They're back in the streets. They're escalating. The movement is turning against Netanyahu. Netanyahu is meeting with the families and telling them there will be no ceasefire. He's basically telling them he's going to kill their children or their loved ones. And when I say kill them, I mean... he. he the Israeli army has killed at least 30 hostages in Gaza since October 7th, probably more. And uh, so, so I think the US and Israel are completely stuck here and they're going to have to cut a deal at some point. There's, there's, there's no way this is going to be resolved militarily. And uh, it's opened up an entire new window into the U.S. presence or, or, or kind of prism for viewing the U.S. presence in the Middle East for us at home, just seeing how much, uh, how secretive it is. There is a new poll out by Defense Priorities today, which is, uh, I would, they're kind of like, I wouldn't call them an anti-war group, but they're sort of like foreign policy moderates and they lobby on the Hill. And this poll found that less than three out of 10 Americans even know that American troops are in Syria. A majority oppose U.S. troops in Syria when they're told there's a right. presence there. But when they're told that U.S. troops face uh, are receiving casualties, are dying, defending that illegally occupied territory, the number of Americans who oppose the U.S. presence in Syria goes up dramatically. So three Americans, Black Americans, who were like weekend warriors, who definitely didn't join the military to be human tripwires for war with Iran, were killed at this Tower 22 base, supposedly in Jordan, but it's right on the other side of the illegal U.S. base at Al-Tanaf in Syria. And uh, it might have they might have been killed in Syria. Their, their job there was basically, they're working on construction to help expand the base. Nobody knew that base existed. I didn't know that base existed. Jordan has denied that the, uh, that the, the, that they were killed in Jordan. So we still don't even know the full story here. So the, but the, what the U S is doing is defending this archipelago of bases there now that aren't popular among Americans. They're prolonging a genocide in Gaza. And there is no clear diplomatic exit ramp that's being provided by Tony Blinken because they're not using the leverage that they have over Israel. They refuse to do it. So this is just a, I mean, it's, 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 we're not just witnessing kind of um, a turning point for Israel. This is a real turning point for American empire. Uh, we're witnessing the acceleration of American decline in the Middle East. So why is the United States doing what it is doing, given that it's not striking significant targets? Uh, you said that Biden wants to just show his own strength. What is motivating the U.S. in these areas and also in Israel? Well, they're defending Israel's strategic depth. And, def and as Jake Sullivan said, NSC director Jake Sullivan, I guess it was on Meet the Press yesterday, and I can't believe they're still saying this. They, Israel needs to fight this war until Hamas is no longer a threat. 
Um, so they're just buying Israel time because the intervention by the Houthis was actually economically effective. And, you know, it's sort of like the old OPEC boycotts where they would actually get together and, and turn off the tap uh, in protest, for example, of Israel's occupation of the Sinai Peninsula. And that's back the organization when, of petroleum exporting countries. Yeah, back when the Arab states weren't completely controlled and co-opted by the West or largely controlled. I mean, what you have here is a collection of non-state actors, some of whom effectively control states or have a large stake in states, like Hezbollah has a huge stake in Lebanon, which is why they're not uh, excited for escalation. But they're, they're, they're filling the void that was left after the end of the Cold War and then the Oslo Accords, where there was just this absence of Arab resistance to the Israeli and US presence in the Middle East. And they're putting pressure on, they're putting pressure on the US and, and Israel in a way that we haven't seen before. I um, mean, all it took was one of the poorest countries in the world um, that had been devastated over the course of uh, eight, eight and a half year proxy war waged through Saudi Arabia, but still stood strong. Uh, all it took is them choking the Red Sea and Bab al-Mandeb off to uh, shipping specifically from Israel and the U.S. to provoke this kind of response because it was economically painful. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it was largely bloodless. The U.S., you would think rationally, would have just responded and said, you know, we need to right the ship. We need to turn down the temperature. Our troops are at risk. By that point, when the Houthis or Ansar Allah started their blockade. Biden said U.S. troops will begin to take casualties because like um, Kaitab Hezbollah, which is a, a Shia oriented resistance group in Iraq, was starting to wage drone like drone swarm attacks on U.S. bases. So Biden called it. He knew U.S. troops would die. He could have prevented those deaths. Those three black American soldiers would still be alive if he had just imposed a ceasefire, but they can't do that. And they can't do that for political reasons, domestic political reasons. Biden will face uh, abandonment of donors to his 2024 re-election campaign. <clears throat> Tony Blinken's future will be in peril because you know he's going to walk through the revolving door, go back to West Exec Advisors after the State Department and hump in contracts through his contacts at state and the Pentagon for arms industry clients that are also invested in Israel and, you know, Israeli tech. I mean, remember uh, West exec advisor, Jen Psaki, who is now the you know chief propagandist at MSNBC was the white house press secretary. She was actually circling, advising, back, circling back to Jen Psaki. Yeah. Circling back. We're going to circle back to Jen Psaki. Yeah. She was consulting for an Israeli spy tech firm through West Exec Advisors. So it's, it's a lot like Ukraine too. I mean, why, why was Victoria Nuland <clears throat> in Kiev promising more, a few surprises for Vladimir Putin and more US aid to a country that's lost the war, um, that's just shoveling whatever's left of their warm bodies into the slaughterhouse in order to just keep this war against Russia going? There's a huge incentive for them. Record record weapon sales. I mean, we're seeing record profits that off the charts profits in weapon sales due to Ukraine. And now due to the post October 7th Gaza war, which is expanding. Um, and, and, and then Tony Blinken's own Zionism is a factor. Jake Z Sullivan, he's not Jewish. He's committed to the Zionist project. I mean, they're all just deeply committed Biden's to this. Biden's a big Zionist and he's not Jewish. And Biden, you know, he's also someone who just doesn't really respect Arabs as a political force. He just has never seen them as a political entity, even either, either in the United States or in the Middle East that deserved respect. Um, and that's, that, that, that's clear from his reflexive reaction to October 7th, where he bear hugged Netanyahu. Tony Blinken went over there to, uh, went to Tel Aviv and said, I come here as a Jew. And it's, that was the moment that he basically forfeited all influence and leverage, as well as his diplomatic status. 
at that point, he was just Netanyahu's bitch, or he was like Netanyahu. Netanyahu was like the bar mitzvah tutor, and he was the bar mitzvah boy. That's what it really felt like at that point. And that's a role that Netanyahu loves to be in. Um, he sees himself sort of as a mentor to U.S. presidents to help them understand the Middle East. And he speaks to them about this Hobbesian jungle that only he understands and that the Arabs only understand force. And now it's clear and you know everyone in the Biden administration knows they kind of got played. They reacted emotionally and now um, they are being, I hate to say dragged in because the U.S., is there for, you know, reasons of its own, but they're being dragged into a situation where they don't really have a clear strategy. They don't have an exit strategy, just like we would, just like George W. Bush's people said. And, and it's not like, uh, it's, it's, it's not very complex. I mean, this is pretty simple. From kind of a, a the, from the point of view of American national interests and real politics, it's pretty simple. You just tell Israel they're not getting spare parts for their F-16s and the whole thing ends. Yeah. They wouldn't last a second, but they won't do it. Um, and this is a real reason to oppose Biden uh, because it means, you know, his base by massive margins supports a ceasefire. I was driving around Capitol Hill today, walking around. For the first time, there are no Ukraine flags up, and there are ceasefire now signs mm. on like every block. There's a house that has a, cease, a full ceasefire now sign. Um, you know, you I, I I watched the Grammys in a sort of act of masochism last night, and you know I was impressed that Annie Lennox made the call for a ceasefire. Artists for ceasefire, peace in the world and she was you know embodying Sinead O'Connor singing nothing compares to right. Sinead O'Connor was critical was vocal, of Israel yeah. she was a vocal supporter of Palestine yeah. you know so I looked at the list of celebrities who had signed on and like these were A-listers there are major people there uh including like Dua Lipa who opened the Grammys uh and you know was up for awards right so it's clear that a, you know a certain line has been crossed where major celebrities are no longer afraid of threatening their own bottom line. These are people in Hollywood but also people in the recording industry and uh you know the liberals the DC liberals are starting to openly oppose the genocide with Full ceasefire now signs, which are like it's it's not like no to the genocide, but it's still something yeah. that is becoming kind of a cause celeb. Yeah, I mean and it still harms it, you. Like Susan Sarandon is is got canceled, but yeah. if you're really 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 rich, no, because she did it early on. Right, she did it. Yeah, she was ahead of the curve. Right. She already knew. A lot of these people are just waking up. Right, to and good on the them. Horror of up, yeah. Israel and Zionism. Right. And you know, the, you got to understand like that area on Capitol Hill, like those are like the Hill staffers. Those are where people who actually have real skin in the game with the Democrats live. When uh, in 2020, they would have huge homemade signs up like, like by Don, it would be right. like, by, it would say Biden. It would be like in the huh? Biden font, but it would right. say by Don. And they home, they made homemade signs for Ruth Bader Ginsburg and put them on their lawns when she died. And now these signs are going up. So this is this is and this is uh, at a point where Donald Trump is beating Biden in the polls, or leading Biden in the polls. The new polls that came out, I think it was like a CNN poll showing that a vast number of Americans trust Donald Trump more on the economy, like by twenty percent, than Joe Biden, even as supposedly the job reports are good. Yeah. So what I'm saying is like Biden is facing so much pressure from his own base to do a ceasefire and he still can't do it. He would rather bomb popular mobilization forces that fought ISIS right. and defend de secret desert bases in the hinterlands on the Jordanian Syrian border than do what his own base wants. And uh, that really shows you what the Democratic Party is, what Joe Biden is, what Nancy Pelosi is barking at protesters outside her 
uh, outside her home, her mansion in San Francisco, that they should go back to China where their headquarters is. So That's what she said. Yeah. Uh, that the FBI should investigate them. You, you're seeing a real disconnect. Like the Democratic Party elite is still stuck in the Trump Russia era. And yeah. they think they can still get away with those old tricks. And it's just not working with their own base. Well, I'm going to ask you more about the uh, presidential elections, but I just wanted to ha show, uh, have you react to a little video since you brought up Annie Lennox, Noah Tishby, friend of the show, Noah Tishby, who uh, identifies as a um, former special envoy for combating anti-Semitism and delegitimization of Israel, mom, author, acting, producing. And she's been talking to a bunch of people like uh, Brett Gelman, who I'd never heard of before October 7th, honestly, um, Deborah Messing, Michael Rappaport, that s s insane British guy who wrote the screenplay to Borat. Uh, but here she is reacting to Annie Lennox. So let's take a look at what she has to say. Uh, did you see this? Is this going to be like a re real time reaction? Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. So uh, tonight, the Grammys were hijacked in favor of Hamas agenda as for a ceasefire, denying Israel's right to defend itself and also not calling for the release of the hostages. So basically giving Hamas exactly what they wanted. You know, I think that next time <laughs> a singer wants to do something that's good for humanity, they should probably call on the release of innocent women and a baby and a toddler from the hands of a genocidal terrorist organization. I think that's probably a good idea. <laughs> wow, so much to unpack there, yeah. Hijacked for, Hama, hijacked for Hamas agenda. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hijacked for Hamas agenda. I mean, if she if she didn't have like a decent American accent, I know she was born and raised in Israel. Yeah. That would be more forgivable. Right. I know. Yeah, you just got that. You just need that indefinite article in there, Noah. And like, come on, who are who is she? She's not like some these people are so such like D listers. Know, That's why they, they really sign are. on to these jobs. Right. But uh but what also like this speaks to what you were talking about before the idea that it's that it's a that a ceasefire is mutually exclusive with bringing hostages home when obviously it's the exact opposite like the only way they can get hostages home is if they pause at the very least obviously a ceasefire would be ideal and that's what we want but they would really rather kill more Palestinians and save Jewish life. Like we all know that they yeah. hate Palestinians, but their shtick is that they're supposed to be a safe space and a haven for Jews and protect Jewish life at all costs. And they're killing hostages. I mean, they literally shot three of their own. They were speaking in Hebrew, waving a white flag. We've reported on what happened on October 7th. Um, but it's just, uh, it's sociopathic, this bloodlust. Yeah. They, I mean, the, the, some of the family members of the hostages are openly stating that they're killing them deliberately to prevent a prisoner swap, which would be politically devastating for Israel's elite. I think, you know, it could actually be good for the population of Israel to turn down the temperature a little bit, but they're so indoctrinated that major, a majority of Israelis support continuing military action indefinitely um, and don't even, they, they they just simply don't understand and what she's what she's calling for is uh something that are actually already happened at the grammys harvey mason jr was the ceo of the recording academy gave some really milk toast annoying speech where he immediately mourned the killing or deaths of people at the Nova Electronic Music Festival and said, basically, they're just killed. They were just killed for being music fans. Um, and we've mourned everything. And, and then and he said 40 of them were taken hostage. Uh, but and we've mourned every day, all the tragedies that have happened since. So not mentioning any Palestinians, or right, of course, mentioning how many Palestinians were killed. I guess they're not music lovers. Then he as he left the stage for classical musicians began playing and he said that they were israelis and palestinians playing together for peace like just the most cartoonish display of liberalism but the fact is the head of the recording academy acknowledged the hostages mm. and the killing of many people on october 7th so she just kind of is lying there 
I didn't really see it be hijacked for Hamas oh, agenda. I lying about that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> one person got up and called for a right. ceasefire. But I mean, there are there are like hundreds of thousands of Israelis or at least tens of thousands protesting for a ceasefire every weekend and camping out outside Netanyahu's house. So I guess that's Hamas agenda too. Right. Noah Tishby is really close to the war cabinet. I mean, she's she had a party at her... Uh, like penthouse apartment in Tel Aviv and Benny Gantz was photographed there putting his arm around her and kind of smiling. And it became a minor scandal in Israel because, you know, it's supposed to be a nation in mourning. People uh, are not partying. going about their usual partying and so on. And although they actually are, um, <clears throat> but you're not supposed to do so publicly. And so Benny Gantz got in trouble and she looked kind of like she wasn't serious. Uh, but Benny Gantz, you know, this is this guy is the chief of staff, was the chief of staff in 2014 who oversaw the 51 day long slaughter. Um, I mean, 100,000 people were turned homeless, hundreds and hundreds of children were killed. I think over a thousand children were killed. Um, and he campaigned on how many Palestinians he killed. When he ran for prime minister against Netanyahu, he had an ad that just showed the ruins of Gaza, and it said, and then and then it um, it cited the entire death toll, which in the Israeli mind is all terrorists, yeah. and it said something like only Benny Gantz knows how to defeat terror. So gross. So there are obviously people who are saying they're not going to vote for Biden. What do you predict about 2024 and how do you think Trump would be as president? And that is where I'm going to leave you on that cliffhanger. So you want to watch the rest of that interview with Max where he talks about what a Trump presidency would be like, where he actually talks about who he thinks should be president next, where he talks about the uh, investigation they did into October 7th, goes through that. Then you can find that at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And you can find that uh, right after we wrap up uh, streaming because we want to make sure that everyone sticks around for this. And then you can go and watch the rest of that Max Blumenthal interview. I think it is a pretty good cliffhanger. But I'm going to bring on the next guests. Make sure you like this stream if you haven't already. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. We're almost at 200K subscribers. And also make sure you become Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. But liking and subscribing is totally free. Okay, we're bringing on our next guests. Uh, and those guests are Daniel Mate, who is a musical theater lyricist, the only uh, mental chiropractor, also a co-writer of a uh, parody video that I did with him, and also Matt Lieb, a podcaster, the host of the Bad Has Barra podcast and an award winner. So let's bring him on. Hi, guys. Hey, hey. hey how you doing? Joining. Good, you? Good, good, good. Hey. Yeah. Hey, Katie. Hi, Matt. Hey, what's up, buddy? What's up, brother? You look good. So do you, but that's nothing new. Yeah. You know, Aww, love we're, just, we're all, there's a very good looking podcast you got yeah, going. Is. That's what we uh, require that. We have auditions beforehand. And if we yeah. don't like the way you look, then we um, put a black screen in front of you. But you can uh -huh. still join. You just can't be visible. I had to submit an audition tape where I was yeah. naked. I yeah. just want everyone in the chat to know that. That that's passed. how it's run. <laughs> Yeah, that is that is how the sausage, so to speak, gets made. Mm -hmm. You know those old those old T-shirts. You know, no fat chicks. You could have a mm -hmm. uh, no mat chicks. This is, no, 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 no ugly guests. Yes, yeah, yes, no yes, ugly yes. Guests. Yeah, yeah. And people, let's just let's just address that uh, that uh, elephant in the room. Yes, Daniel Mate is Aaron Mate's brother, and the son of Gabor Mate, mm -hmm. and co-author, and co-author of a book that they wrote called "The Myth of Myth of Normal." What Which we talked about on on the show, uh, trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture, and you yeah. can go back through the Katie Helper Show archives and find uh, our yeah. interview on the topic. Yeah, there you go. So before we get into our interview, where we're going to be talking about Hasbara and satire, I do have to take this opportunity to play once more. If you've already seen it, I'm sorry. Should we play it once more? Daniel, I can never. I can. I can, I can, right. I can never. I want to hear it. All right. So we're going to be. And should we be off stage so people can just experience it full 
screen. Yeah, I right? mean, otherwise they'll have to see your face while you're experiencing it, and they'll I know, see. And that seems a little it's bit too like, embarrassing. Yeah, it's too you'll, embarrassing. You'll see me slapping my own knee know, at my little exactly, jokes yeah. and laughing hysterically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is a video that um, Daniel and I uh, co-wrote the words to, and then our friends at um, Kinky Roach Productions did the video too. And actually, the behind-the-scenes uh, birth of it is, I texted Daniel and my friend. And I was like, we got to do a cover of this song, um, Ain't No Stopping Us Now, We're at the Hague. You know, Ain't No Stopping Us Now, and We're at the Hague. And that was yeah, because the, Netanyahu the, the, had tweeted tune. out. Yeah, the disco tune. That's because Netanyahu had tweeted out, no, no one's going to stop us, not the Hague, et cetera, et cetera. But then you came back with your idea of doing Nothing's Going to Stop Us, the song by Starship, featured yeah, in that perfect. film, Mannequin. Yeah, from 1987 with, yeah. Uh, yeah, Elizabeth Shue and whoever it was. Uh, yeah, I just felt that, number one, 80s pop is more universal. It is. And just in terms of a song form that's parodyable and the, the catchiness of the chorus. Right. And the... the it was a much better. And, yeah, and the, and, the, and the bromance element of what we were going that's for. True, right. That's true. Yeah. It's a love song, yeah. Daniel is, uh, plays voices by Bibi Netanyahu. And the wonderful Mike McRae does Biden. So yeah. The, both are perfect, but yeah. that BB singing is yeah. incredible. Well, it's, I had some great I had some so great good. voice coaching from our director, Katie. I mean, yeah. Katie's a little modest, but you were really the brains behind the operation and keeping an eye on the video and the audio. And I did one take of BB that just sounded like me, really. Then I had really, to go back and it was go deeper gorgeous. into my method, you know. Yeah, and sort I, of, yeah. I, I encourage you to re to to bebify. Yourself. Yeah, you did you like in order to get method? Did you like go well, down the street and kick a child in the face? I, I went to New Jersey and sold some furniture. Oh. Yeah, I really, I really became a. I mean, I, I couldn't do it, but but except you know, you really believed in me. You were a, you were a believe beer. A believer, yeah, believe yeah, beer, yeah. 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 Well, I believe in, I believe in both of you. I be believe in you. I be mm -hmm. believe in you. Someone in the comments is like, I'm never going to be able to watch Mannequin again without laughing, which I didn't realize people <laughs> were still watching Mannequin, but nice. I don't think Mannequin is supposed to be like a heavy, serious. I know. Piece. Like, I, I think you're allowed to laugh during Mannequin. Like, right. It's like, a, I'll it's never watch light. Tinder's <laughs> List or Mannequin again without laughing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Both but, comedies. Both comedies. Yeah. I'll never be able to keep a straight face during Mannequin again. It's going to be so hard. <laughs> so hard for me. So uh, speaking of laughter, Matt, tell us about how you started this podcast. Uh, Bad has Barra and what the premise of it is. It's great. Yes. I, I really like it. So um, it is, I started it in like late December. Um, and the premise of it is uh, it's about uh, Hezbara. It's about Israeli PR. And uh, it the name I got from an old uh, J book, Jew, Jew book group um, that I was a part of, you know, back when people were on Facebook. And uh, it was just like a, you know, a group of uh, Jews getting together and just sharing the worst uh, Israeli propaganda um, and just kind of making fun of it. And it's something I kind of always wanted to turn into a podcast. But, you know, I just was like, I, I already I do too many goddamn podcasts, so I can't just also do it. And then um, the seventh happened and um i find my i found myself just kind of screaming into the void and onto my phone making these like you know uh satire videos in order to basically to like shade all of my uh liberal zionist uh like friends and acquaintances and people that i've you know known for years and years um just to show them what they sounded like and um uh yeah and then eventually i was like this is i have i have too much there's too much content here like it's an overload the hasbara has never been so bad um and i was like fuck it i'm just gonna i'm gonna just start doing a podcast you know i'll, I'll put it out whenever i feel like it and it's been like uh, i don't know it's been like a little over a month and i i've done too too many episodes i've done like 11 episodes in you know 40 days or something and then my life is uh is hell but it's uh, I, it's a lot of fun I, I, i've been on three of them right yeah 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 you've been uh on the most you are you are uh, like officially my uh my sometimes co-host of the show uh whenever i can get you 
then uh, yeah. you know we worked you, we worked out the uh, we worked out the Amber Ailey Frost uh, contract. You know, that's right. That's right. Of, of Chop of Fame. This the sometimes yeah one always there in the background. It's me just texting, being like, please, <laughs> please, please come on. You're so smart. <laughs> please be available in half an hour from now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but so yeah, that's. That's Sorry. what happened. Yeah, that's and how did each of you um, kind of like learn and then unlearn your Zionism? I never learned Zionism all the way because I had a I, I had a prophylactic. I had a Zionist condom on, which mm -hmm. was my anti-Zionist father who sent me to a Zionist summer camp. Yeah, and to Hebrew school in preparation for my bar mitzvah, um, with you know a rabbi who would pull me aside and say, look, Daniel, your father's a, a smart guy and he does good medical work, but his views on Israel are garbage and you shouldn't listen to him. And that was the class in which we would play like board games in which, you know, you land on a certain square. It says, talk to the PLO, move back three spaces. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> wow. I remember that vividly. At least talk to them. At least you talk to them as opposed to do something more violent, which is what they probably wanted the game to consist of. But Right, but they're they're teaching well, I guess us that liberal Zionists, not not right wing Zionists. Yeah, they like to pretend no, but they, that everything no, they do is nice. My synagogue was right wing, basically. Oh, okay. oh sick. My my summer camp was liberal. My summer camp was kibbutz socialist, mm -hmm. and it was a utopia. It was heaven on earth for me. I loved it. I got along so much better with my peers at camp. It was musical. This is where I learned to write parody songs. This is where my I could let my you know my freak flag fly in the sense of just being able to fully be myself and hang out with kids of all ages and you know and the it, so it was just great and that's where I started I had Israeli counselors called madrichim I learned some Hebrew and the there was a certain there was a fair amount of indoctrination everything was related to Israel and ultimately the the mess the ultimate takeaway is Aliyah is better than no Aliyah there is better than here. Aliyah is there, going back. It means going up, right? Going up to the it, mountain. It means yes. when you're Jew and you go back, quote unquote, to Israel. Right. It's funny. It's the same word that's used um, in synagogue when you go up to read the Torah. So it's like you're actually elevating yourself spiritually. And the word for leaving Israel, emigrating out of Israel, is yerida, which means going down. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's like droopy, the the elevator. Uh, Elevator dog going up, sir. Right. Going down, sir. Um, so anyway, it was very compelling and it was, you know, tempting, but I never fully bought it because I've always been very sensitive to manipulation and also like group sentiment and the and mm. just the the sentimentality of Zionism and the kind of just a national identity. I just never felt an, a hunger for it. There's something kind of unkosher to me about it because I just liked my I liked being a North American Jew, you know? Yeah. I, I didn't want that disparaged, and it was taken for granted that we were somehow unhappy. So I stayed in the, the youth group just for the perks, you know, and, and enjoying it so much. And there started to be more space uh, for dissent. I started having counselors who would bring in articles uh, about Yesh Gavul, the the group of Israeli soldiers, it's called there is a, Geshkavul means there is a limit, literally, and it was the Israeli soldiers who refused to serve in the occupied territories during the first intifada. So I started, and then learning about the Palestinians, and there was more and more room, and then I became a counselor, and I tried to push the envelope, and once I tried to get about three minutes of Nakba content into a Independence Day activity, <laughs> and I got a ton of pushback, and I kind of realized that it's like certain... Israeli Independence Day. Yeah, Yom Hatzma'ut, like a, a whole special day devoted to it where we play act, like, and it's a surprise to the kids. All of a sudden, the lights go out at dinner and we say, we have just been released from Auschwitz. What are we going to do? We could go to North America. We go here. We're going to go to Palestine and blah, blah, And then we take a boat trip and then we get there and there's British guards being all British and blokey. Mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, there's some Arabs running around in like towels and, you know, it's like just terribly racist. Um, Wait, did you, it was this like play acting? Like, uh, or, or, do, or did we hire real Arabs? Yeah. No, I'm wondering if you like had the kids like go and blow up the King David Hotel and stuff like that. Yeah, was, right. Was no, yeah. We, it was a, it was a selective history, let's say. Okay. Uh, it was You really had people dress up as Arabs though? So uh, when I was, a, I don't remember if we did it when I was a counselor, but I do remember as a kid, we, they would wake us up in the middle of the night. The, the activity was called Aliyah Bet, which is, the second wave of mm -hmm. Aliyah in the in the the 1940s, um, and and yeah, we'd, we they'd wake us up in the middle of the night and say we've got to go, 
and it's always a surprise. And then we get out mm -hmm. and then we're using flashlights and there's like, we hear, and usually the Israeli counselors would play the Arabs because they could speak some pidgin Arabic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, help you suspend your disbelief. Exactly. And, but that's not the only Arabic content at summer camp. Every Friday night we would do Rikude Am, which is Israeli dancing, which I loved. Wow. Mm -hmm. And one, mm -hmm. one of the songs on the cassette for the advanced Israeli dancing after the little kids go to bed, the older kids get to stay up and do it, was like an Arabic song where we did some like, some, you know, Arabic vibes movement. And that was always actually the best song, yep. but I'm sure it was horribly, um, I mean, talk about cultural appropriation. Yeah. So wow. yeah, it's a whole country made out of it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then what about your time in Israel? Yeah. Well, before that, I should also say, speaking of cultural appropriation, and it wasn't just summer camp year round. There was something called the Ken, which in Hebrew means nest. And in, in your local home city, there'd be activities all the way around to all year round to keep people connected to the camp community. And every year there was something called Neshef, which is a pageant, but we'd always do a musical and it was always a spoof musical. Mm -hmm. And I started, I wrote some and I ended up writing music, directing and directing a show called Little Shop of Hummus or Hummus, of course, as we pronounce it in the Zionist world. And what's hilarious about this show? Can, Israel it, should make a, a musical called "Little Shop of Hamas" mm -hmm. about Hamas. <laughs> <Umbra. laughs> little Shop yeah. of Hamas, yeah, exactly yeah. right. Little shop, little shop so of you already got falafel. Out. Stop yeah. at the little shop of Hamas. Yeah, I got to rhyme falafel with awful. But the thing is, the show was about ostensibly about cultural appropriation and Jew and assimilation. How Jews are losing their culture, right? And there was a big mean hot dog from outer space instead of the plant who comes and like uh. tries to sell him unkosher stuff and takes away his menorahs and whatever. But the, the location of the thing was a fucking falafel shop. <laughs> yeah, right. And this is our authentic Jewish culture yeah. that's being yeah. polluted. You're losing like, your culture, you know. Yeah, the, the one exactly. we're just gonna supplant right now. That's right. Now, over. if we had been talking about the plight of Mizrahi Jews who were sure. uprooted from Arab countries where they were. Arabic speakers mm -hmm. and fully integrated, that would have been one thing. But we Mizrahi were Jews are non Ashkenazi, are the Jews who are not Ashkenazi. They're yeah, Middle Eastern. Eastern Jews. Yeah, just the people. Yeah, there. yeah. Mizrahi also called Eastern. Sephardic. Mm -hmm. Well, there's it's actually, there's actually, I'm learning this a distinction, but because Sephardic is more from Spain, Spain and Mizrahi yeah, is right. from oh. the East. But okay. yeah. It's all non Ashkenazi to me, so it's all Greek to <laughs> well, me. Well, yeah. The, yeah, exactly. I know, problematic. I know, problematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we're, 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 we're all on it. We're all on it. And another episode. We're all on a learning curve. I could We're suggest all... some guests. I could suggest some guests for you, actually. But so anyway, Israel. Just to be brief, there is this w trip called workshop that kids do after high school. Workshop shall oh. set shall set you free. Mm -hmm. Workshop shall set you free. Exactly. Oh, yeah, those right over the camp. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Slang <laughs> arbeit shop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, if you if you invert the first and last letters of workshop, you get pork show, which is mm. fun. Um, and you know, and you go live on a kibbutz, and you work on a, uh, a kibbutz. And I worked in irrigation. And my first act of subterfuge or sabotage, unintentionally, was I was driving a tractor. I didn't have a driver's license at the time. I was driving a tractor with a big ass twelve meter pipe wagon behind me, coming back from the watermelon fields or whatever. And I turned Ironic. a corner. Watermelon, little Palestinian uh, mm -hmm. subversion, right there. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Little did I know. Of course, that was the watermelon thing had already been cut, but I didn't know it. We didn't know anything. We saw yeah. the field workers coming in from Gaza every day. We were 20 kilometers from the Gaza border, had no idea what was what the reality was there. None. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I turned a corner a little too sharply and I heard a a crash and a pop and all that. And I looked behind me and pipes, metal pipes are flying everywhere because there's a geyser 30 or 40 meters high. I ran over the main Israeli water line. That's good. Good for you. <laughs> It was, probably going to, it was probably going to the Gaza settlements. Yeah. So that was a year of immersion sort of into Israeli society and a lot of different, it's not like birthright. Birthright is this, it's sexual Zionism, pure and oh. simple. They terrorize you at Auschwitz and then they say, here's the solution. This was yeah. more like here, get to know the country, some of the good, some of the bad, but it was still carefully curated. So yeah. when I, when I tried to arrange Palestinian guests or even anti-Zionist guests, there was always some security concern or whatever. Um, so I didn't fall in love with the place. It's more dangerous when it's not overt uh, um, propaganda because it has some 
like honest you're like well they're not totally um over the time i mean this is kind of to me it's like liberal zionism right it's like Completely. well they're not totally biased they understand palestinians are human beings and then you of course you let your your um wall down a little mm -hmm. bit yeah that's right well it's it's not unrelated to liberal liberalism i mean see right. see also see also the democratic party mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and eventually i just had when i got to mcgill in montreal and i actually met some actual palestinians and I actually listened for the first time. Up until that point, they'd been sympathetic abstractions at best. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I was like, hmm, yeah, pretty incomplete education. And I'm I'm done with it. But it wasn't really until October 8th that I stepped up in any way to talk about this stuff publicly. Yeah. And what and about you? Yeah, that's right. Um, what about you, Matt? Well, for me, I I didn't I grew up secular, uh, and so, so did Daniel, right? Even though I mean, you you were secular even though you went to Hebrew school, right? Yeah, I mean, right. I went to I went to Hebrew school just enough to teach me how right. to chant for right. my bar mitzvah. But when you right. say you were secular, Matt, like you didn't go to Hebrew school, I didn't go to Hebrew mitzvah. school at yeah, all. Me neither. Yeah, and so uh, my most of my connection um, to Judaism, other than like you know uh, culturally and. Uh, um, neighborhood wise and you know whatnot was through um zionism in terms where of where you grow up uh, i grew up in west los angeles okay um and uh you know i uh, i went to public school but you know most of most of my friends were jewish i kind of just assumed everyone was uh there was jews and there was christians and you know and i was like in between i was both of them and so, so your family's mixed is that my yeah i came from a, a mixed family and uh so it was for me growing up i uh my connection through uh you know to judaism was not a religious connection but a, a ethnic connection and a um sort of an ethno-nationalist connection in terms of uh israel was the place that i would someday have to go when you know the nazis came back to power it was just kind of like you know b being told a lot that like one day this you know disaster is going to be befall the jewish people in america and we're all going to get to go to israel um and so zionism was just kind of it kind of supplanted any kind of religious education uh for me it was just kind of part of it it was just like you know you were um it's funny because like the the idea of the dual loyalty trope is always like trotted out and i was i always kind of felt like you know well you know we're all israeli like that was kind of like the thing um and it wasn't until you know i kind of started growing up and went to college and that i started kind of pushing back on this idea of it and then kind of like started getting a little bit creeped out by the um the obsession uh with uh blood as it relates to Jewish people, thinking that of that as kind of like a sort of race science Nazi connection, um, you know, this kind of like ethnic right that we have as Jews to, you know, have this land. And I started kind of like looking at all of the, I mean, here's the thing, when you grow up in, you know, uh, uh, around a lot of Jews, which most people don't, um, you know them to you know be all kinds of people and one of the types of people is i knew a lot of fucking racists <laughs> i knew a lot of people were racist as shit they were just white americans essentially a lot of them um and that included you know the kind of like inter-jewish racism that you would see uh you know um between white jews and jews of color and you would see that you know we're uh we're not um immune from being kind of you know assholes we're we're just people right um and so once i started kind of like being deprogrammed uh and this was mostly through you know it's not nothing special at first it was just kind of like going to college uh and just being like oh damn this seems like it's fucked up over there but i still kind of held on to the idea of like you know well you know everyone should just vote better you know the idea of like if everyone just like voted for the good guy <laughs> then you know then we could do a two-state solution totally normal you know thing to me this idea of like yeah no just we should separate the ethnicities um and then it wasn't until birthright i went on birthright in uh, 2012 uh when i realized um how much the zionist project relied 
on young American Jews in order to push this uh this agenda in order to like and let me just sorry one second i just want to make sure people watching know birthright is a program that's for jews who have never been to yes. israel at um at least it, you can still go if you've been with your family but they've right. never been like on their own to israel and it's a fully paid for trip yes it's when, a he, Jewish... when he hears something hear something just interesting just to tie it yeah. kind of come full circle so you talked about the wire right Mm -hmm. Well, I recently found out that uh, Benga Akinagwe, who played Chris Partlow on The yes. Wire, is, n is a neighbor of mine. Yes. And we, we went out and had lunch. So And jealous. first of all, he is not nearly as tall as they thought he would be. So mm -hmm. I, I, but he's still, he's an incredible guy. Mm -hmm. Despite um, not being that tall, still incredible. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, what, I meant to, what I meant to say is inc incredibly handsome and attractive and yeah. uh uh, just, I was happy to be seen with him. It's a jab at me. Um, when he met me, he he immediately see, <laughs> said, "Matt, you're too tall," and then he punched right. me in the nose. Right. <laughs> I punched you in the part that I could reach. Right. So, the, the, yeah. I say the nose, head. but it was the, the dick. Head. But but here's the thing: this guy who is Nigerian born went on birthright. They also let non-Jews. Yes. Yeah. It is. It is a not black, a... a black guy from a black guy from Maryland. Yeah. Birthright? Yeah. Why birthright? You just have to be open. We'll, I mean, we'll, get, we'll get back there's to that. all sorts yeah. of different trips right Have, so okay. there, there's there's some of the taglit trips are that's birthright some of the birthright trips are uh religious um some of them are secular mine was mixed jews for the most part uh i, I and mixed non-bar mitzvah jews right and but so you can do one for non-jews too like i can't... i assume so i mean it is they're selling you a timeshare essentially yeah. and i think like the with the you know uh, there's got to be Christian Zionist groups. There's got to be right. all sorts, right? Because it's a sales, it's a sales tool. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, for me, it was all of these like you know uh, non bar mitzvah Jews, and um, it was like literally I had my I had my bar mitzvah in Israel when a, one of the tour guides just was like, "You're a man now," and gave us all like Hebrew names. And uh, I was like, I'm pretty sure it doesn't work like that. I went to lots of bar mitzvahs. Right. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do off tour and poor. What's your Hebrew nothing. name? <laughs> so I wanted it to be Dove, uh, Dove, but for some reason, uh, one is Dobby, like the fucking Harry Potter. I, I don't know. Uh -huh. I felt like, I felt like the tour guide was clowning me a little bit but he called me dobby and i was like i, I get that you're trying to make me feel small because you, you know, i'm six foot six but well that, that would probably be the diminutive of dove because the oh, v and the the v and the b are the same letter i didn't wouldn't... consider that maybe yeah. he was nice uh yeah, so like D D david becomes duty in 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 israeli hebrew oh, so there's all kinds duty. of little... yeah. yeah no one wants to be duty no one wants uh, to be duty uh, but yeah, so um, when I went there, I realized uh, how important this trip was, not for me, but for them. I realized that it was this like um, really, uh, you know, it was a hard sales tactic. It was like they were trying to make sure that we went back and told people what we saw there, uh, which was, you know, basically what we saw was Jewish Disneyland in which like I went to a country in which they were singing songs that I sang at like Jewish day camp. And I was like, uh, what well, well, this is bullshit. No fucking way. This is a whole nother country. You're telling me you made a whole country out of fucking day camp. Nah, -uh. I smell, this is a red flag. Um, and it was like on the third night of it, the craziest shit was that um, there was a giant mega event, a mega birthright event, all the birthright trips in an arena. And uh, they had all these like speakers and rappers and whatnot. Um, and rappers, uh, Israeli rappers. They, they oh, was, Israeli. Okay. The, this one group literally rapped about how uh, Israelis invented the cherry tomato. And it was just, they were really stuck on this idea that they wow. invented the cherry tomato, which is not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I think the people of Cherry Apple, picked that fact. Sorry, I couldn't. No, no, the, the cherry tomatoes come. Mm -hmm. Well, it's cherry picked. Ah, very good. Come on. That's very, very good. good. Very good. No, I, I, when I was in Naples, Italy uh, earlier this year, they told me that like cherry tomatoes come from Mount Vesuvius right nearby. So, mm. yeah, well, uh, and uh, Haretz did like a, a, a whole article where they're like, guys, what are we doing? Why are we telling people we invented the cherry tomato? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, the craziest thing was the headlining speaker was Benjamin Netanyahu. 
um literally while he was prime minister he he was he took time out of his schedule to come talk to us uh tell us that we um actually belonged to israel that 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 was our home and then told us to um he's you know number one he wanted us to uh make aliyah but but if we didn't do that what he wanted was for us to um be his own personal hasbara army and uh, he wanted us to go and tell, he's like, tell people what you saw here. And then he proceeded to tell us what we saw there. Um, <laughs> you know, you saw a land where, you know, uh, uh, women can, you know, uh, work at jobs and uh, Arabs are happy all the time and tell them there is no wall, there is no occupation, sleep. Um, it was very, I mean, it was just so clearly this propaganda trip, but I didn't know um that in even in just going to this thing that i was um number one going to be so affected by it because i'll uh, i'll admit what well, i left being like you know it is like kind of complicated <laughs> um <laughs> but i also left um with this like gross feeling of like i am basically being told you know as i think every Jewish kid is told, you know, by family and whatnot, that it is our, our responsibility to um, stop the liars from spreading lies about Israel. And um, just kind of this gross feeling of like feeling like I was uh, a tool for this ongoing, you know, the ongoing uh, Zionist project, the, you know, greater Israel project even. And um, yeah, and then it just like it just came to a point where I was like, "Ah, fuck this! This is uh, this is all this is all bullshit and wrong, and it's used to justify some of the most atrocious behavior, and it is deeply uh, rooted in anti-Semitism." And uh, you know, as someone who does not like anti-Semitism, <laughs> uh, I was I realized that this was a project that was almost um, relied on the existence and perpetuation of it in order to function. And I was like, oh, this kind of makes this the uh, biggest anti-Semitic enterprise in in my lifetime, you know. And I uh, yeah, and then I decided to fucking. I don't know. I mean, I didn't really do anything with it. All I did was like get into arguments with people about it. Um, and that's kind of where I, you know, started finding more and more people who were critics of it. And then uh, eventually, you know, um, I, I actually ended up getting a job. I worked uh, for AJ Plus for uh, like four or five years. Uh, they were based in San Francisco. I met my wife there, uh, Francesca Fiorentini, who uh, I think you you guys have met before um katie and uh we uh started like a comedy show there and i was like you know i think i want to do like some videos about israel and that's when i first started making like uh critical of israel content you know and started talking about them as kind of an anti-semitic entity and uh that's when i first started getting uh, a lot of hate from uh you know the zionist internet personalities and i learned all of them like i learned about hen mazig years oh ago yeah. when he was trying to drag me for some shit i did with the uh, aj plus and uh it's just like now i'm seeing all of these like this cast of characters like they're all back but now they have this national spotlight because of october 7th and i'm like people gotta know what their game is like you have to people need to be informed uh like henma zieg's entire thing is being like well i'm a gay person of color and therefore genocide is it that wrong you know like that's his his entire thing is like pink washing it's just like using the language of activism and the language of the left the language invented by marginalized communities uh in order to fight against their marginalization and using that and inverting it to uphold this you know oppressive system and uh if you don't know that especially if you're like a liberal and liberals are i think uh, uh kind of stupid <laughs> in that like you just say the right words and they're like oh you must be good you said all my you know what's, favorite words and you know what's that's great not, Matt, is that, that yeah sorry they, they sorry to interrupt but they, they told you that your job was to go out there yeah. and like 
expose the lying liars who lie about Israel. And guess what you're doing? Yeah, literally. That's exactly what I, I, I decided to do. I'm like, you know, at one point I, I found the video of that speech that um oh, wow. netanyahu gave because i was like i was just like i i, I wonder if it's it was such a big event maybe they taped it and i found it and one of the th- things that he said in it was uh the, something like the only the only cure for telling a lie uh for or the only cure for a lie is to tell the truth and i was like you know interesting point and I think mm-hmm. you might be right about that. So uh, yeah, I decided, uh, you know, fuck it. I'm gonna start talking about these guys and trying to expose them for the fucking lazy fucking liars that they are. Cause it's, it's, all, it's all lazy. And I think people see that now. And I, that's one of the reasons I started it. The podcast now is because I was like, I think people, this isn't a niche subject anymore, at least not as much as it was. Like people kind of, they they know this world now because they're seeing on the news every day these fucking charlatans and worms going on TV and just saying the most disconnected from reality bullshit and people are like I I don't think this is I think this is lies this feels very lie-y, you know and, and when you say that you saw anti-semitism coming from Israel can you uh, explain what you meant um, what I mean by that is that, like, Israel, uh, well, number one, the just on a grand scale, it does rely on having an enemy in order to justify its existence. I mean, the whole purpose of Zionism is that Jews, because of historical anti-Semitism, because we've always been attacked, um, deserve to have their own state, uh, you know, because a state offer security that like it's a very 19th century thinking here but the you know it's the idea is that the only way to secure a people is through statism right Right. and so uh so on a like a grand scale it's like the existence of israel relies on the existence of an enemy um and anti-semitism on anti-semitism right uh the idea that there are anti-semites out there trying to destroy you that's why you need israel um, which is something that the fucking like president will say, which is right. insane. Um, but also, like on a on a smaller scale, you see the amount of um, loathing that a lot of Zionists have for uh, diaspora Jews, for Jews who are uh, like American Jews, you know, any, anyone um, from a country uh, in the West, quote unquote. Uh, that is, I mean, you know, that has people, especially who speak out, but even who don't, they don't like non Sabras, <laughs> you know, they, not they, born in Israel. yeah, people who are not born in Israel, they, they including are, Arab Jews, they, they don't like Arab yes. Jews very much either. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's a lot, there's Darker a lot skin Jews. of, uh, racism against Mizrahi Jews. I mean, just the name Mizrahi Jew is already a, and uh, like this part of it is like Arab racism there because they don't they they don't call them Arab Jews. Right. There's like no 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 we are not Arab. Um but yeah, uh just on an individual le- level, you know, there's this idea, you know, amongst um that Israel pushes which is that like Israel, you know, that's where the real strong Jews come from, the square jaw Jews, you know, the yeah. the Aryan Blonde. Jews. <laughs> Blonde hair, blue Jews eyed, sure. you know. The and, hero and of Exodus Aryans was an are Aryan also bronze, Jew, kind of. Yes, but also Bron- like yeah, yeah. because they can take the, so Rome, the like R- R- Greco, Greco Roman. Yeah, right. right, right, and and like you know, and kind of portraying uh, the diaspora Jew, the New York Jew, is like this sniveling he's, coward. He's sniveling. Yeah, right. You he's, know, like these like, are the people does who, nothing while his wife and sister and mother get raped by. Right. Um, exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like and and almost kind of like a. Um, uh you know in a way blaming the weakness of uh the non-israeli jew for anti-semitism you know for the holocaust and and you know i think uh yeah if you i don't know if you have had uh ellie valley on the show but he's a great artist yeah uh, i was exactly think of that diaspora boy what is it diaspora yeah, man and yeah it's like uh, sabra man diaspora and diaspora boy and israel man or something yeah israel yeah. man and Di- diaspora boy his sidekick who's this like you know he's drawn as this like sniveling yeah. jewish coward you know and uh it's 
it, th that's very much a thing. And then you just like, in terms of like uh, the amount of anti-Semitism that they, um, you know, uh, are okay with existing in America. I mean, right. you know, they align themselves with right-wing governments right. all over the place. They, yeah, they... and like, uh, right, right-wing governments with John Hagee, who says mm -hmm. that like it, Hitler was sent by God. Yeah. Yes. They, and of they... course, they create anti-Semitism by doing awful things in the name of Judaism and Jews and Jewry. Yes, yes, exactly. And like just the idea that they push the, uh, you know, the idea that all Jews are a, you know, basically in lockstep right. supporting israel and to to the degree where you don't really they don't really even give space to any you know jewish critic of israel right. um even uh, on the smallest level they will easily j drag uh, um any like a, an arab who says any small hint of a uh, critique of israel you know they'll 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 destroy them they'll do the same to anti-zionist jews but right now they're like doing their best to yeah. not draw attention because right. their entire yeah. premise of everything since the seventh is all jews agree with this war and it's fucked up that you are so anti-semitic that you're against this war yeah and they they're the ones who perpetuate the dual loyalty oath 100 percent. anyone else by presenting yeah. Yeah, it as if strong, you're yeah. all yeah. yeah and and then to complete to complete the irony yeah. sorry katie mm -hmm. go ahead no, 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 I was going to sh shift to some videos, but make okay. put the bow on just, it. Just to, to sort of put the bow on the irony, what do they call us? They call us self-hating Jews. Yeah. Well, Jewish self-loathing is at the the heart of Zionism. Yeah, exactly. Just a mm -hmm. And I said I said this on your podcast, Matt. Mm -hmm. Our podcast, I should say. That's right. Um, uh, the, the 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 at the heart of Zionism is a deep, deep rejection of Jewish vulnerability, pain, suffering, and exile. Mm -hmm. And a rejection of the really the benefits of exile and all the beautiful things that have come out of it, yes. which, um, and exile just means dispersion. You know, just being in a lot of different places, having different perspectives, being slightly on the outs of society. Obviously, there's a lot of grave dangers to that. I have sympathy for the people in that era who were like, "Fuck this! I want a piece of the nationalist pie. I, of you know, course. we we deserve to be safe too." It's an understandable impulse. Right. But if you read Jabotinsky, I mean, you had Yaakov Shapiro yeah. on your show, Katie, and he That's just laid it out. Yeah. He read this Jabot, this the skin. I was going to say skin curdling. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that works. Uh, the, yeah, the skin curdling quote from Jabotinsky, just about the. It, I mean, it could have been right out of Der Sturmer, yeah. and the level of self hatred it takes to look at the Jews who died in Auschwitz and say they went like lambs to the slaughter yeah, as if yeah, that's yeah. a pejorative or something like that right. creates this, uh, this imperative to flush the weakness out of your system. And now anyone who's yeah. weak or below you, and now you have, that's the psychological, emotional seeds of suppression premacy, which is a rejection of your own trauma, your own homelessness, your own orphanhood and your own uh, pain. And, uh, and here we are. Yeah. Well, I wanted to show some of the videos that you've done, Matt, because they really capture so much about this liberal Zionism. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they're very politically useful, actually. Let's start with the one where, because you brought up growing up thinking that maybe you'd have to go to Israel mm, to flee. Yeah. So let's watch that one, uh, Brad. I believe that is um, four. I well, Brad cues like it up. People... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I, I've told Matt this. The first time I saw a Matt Lee video, I totally got punked. I totally got punked. I was right ready to, I actually quote tweeted it. I'm like, look at this fucking liberal Zionist. <laughs> he was the sincerity, the deadpanness. And then I looked at the, con and then I saw the Francesca connection and I was like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. And I'm hard to fool. So yeah. props to you, Matt. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people do not understand what Israel means to me uh, as an American Jew. Uh, as a liberal Zionist, it's kind of like our plan B. Like our plan A, obviously, is to, you know, not have racist, bigoted genociders coming to power in America so we can live here peacefully. If that doesn't happen, then we're going to have to move to Israel. And the only way to escape the racist, bigoted genociders is to just do a racist, bigoted genocide ourself. You have to understand that like one day I might have to move there probably. <laughs> Basically, 
we have to do our own genocide in order to not do to get genocide we have to do genocide firsties i want to live in peace i don't want to fight in a war so i'm gonna let the israelis die in a war and i'm gonna let the palestinians die even more in a war i could show up and go oh good there's no there we already did a genocide and i can be like that was bad we shouldn't have done that but, you know, I'm glad, though. I don't want to live in a war zone, so I want them to do the war now and then show up. But probably never. I don't even want to live there because I like it here because I've got a nice apartment. I'm in a good neighborhood for school. Like, I don't actually think I will ever move there. But just in case, they should kill all of them. Because what if we get genocided here? God forbid. So we got to do it first. Then, then I still won't move there, but I'll, I'll be glad. So that's uh, that's good. That's that's liberal Zionist. That yeah, yeah. that one is yeah. kind of high concept. Like, there's no other one I know where like there's a moment where all of a sudden the world flips and your voice <laughs> yeah. changes and you go like it's it's well, like there really is another trippy. One that's kind of like that one, the bad one, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The bad one. That. I've gone yeah. bad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah let's play yeah, yeah. that one. That's uh, clip number one, Brad. Yeah. Well, I'm a liberal Zionist, and um, I have to say that I actually do agree with a lot of what the pro-Palestinian left has to say about Israel. The occupation is awful, and it needs to end. The settlers are crazy. We have to do something about that. Netanyahu is a criminal. He's going to lead Israel to ruin. The 17-year siege of Gaza has been brutal, and it is completely unconscionable. I agree that Israel is essentially, in parts of it, an apartheid state but like the one thing is after the seventh the thing is is that i don't care anymore <laughs> i'm bad now because like uh, here's the thing after the seventh i just kind of realized if it's us or them then it's gotta be us no more them i never thought i could be a fascist but i think i'm a fascist now and it's kind of great because i have all these new friends me and amy schumer and the ugly guy from stranger things and i'm getting all these new job opportunities and i'm like okay if this is what i didn't know that fascism came with stuff if I had known that, I'd have been a fascist a long time ago. It's kind of nice, too, because now I get to be like, ooh, I'm bad. So I'm just going to be bad now. Like, I can still believe all that other stuff, too, but just not now. I'm going to wait till later. But for now, I'm going to be bad. Okay. Bye-bye. So those are both really good and... um like high, high concept kind of as, D as daniel was saying right you have the you you turn yeah that yeah that just kind of like came uh yeah i just started doing that uh, for that video the i'm bad now video and i was like oh that's a fun way to uh like you know visually show someone turning into a little fucking baby right because th that is and with this one you had the red light too right uh, All of a yeah, sudden, yeah, there was yeah, like a... yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. it was the I changed the light settings in this room. I did it in here. Okay, um, got it. But yeah, like the whole, you know, like you know, concept there in terms of like you know what I'm doing is uh, I, I turn into a fucking baby because this is like the thing I noticed. Like both of those things are based on conversations that I had, and I've had nothing but fucking conversations since October seventh with um, Jews that I know who I've been watching, you know, like become nationalists out of fucking nowhere and and trying to like trying to, you know, like first hear them out because I'm not here to yell at them. And, you know, these are people that I know I want to listen and I want to understand. Um, and then me trying to reason with them and just like hitting this brick wall where I realize at some point they just turn into a little baby in the conversation. It becomes yeah. like, you know, well, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I just feel like we have to like, what else can we do? Yeah. This I love big, that. I love that. I saw you, yeah. What else? And you actually tweeted this out, nine character. You just tweeted this out. It wasn't a video. It's like, is there something between nothing and genocide? Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. It's, it's just the dumbest. It's the dumbest premise. Like, well, what it's... we can't help but kill yeah. 30,000 people because what's the other answer? No response. Yes. And, and that that's the, uh, you know, this like 
this baby character that a lot of people put on some people i think are doing it earnestly i think uh, you know some people are just babies <laughs> you know uh and then some uh, you well see i've actually of... been really dis i've been really disappointed with the conversations i've been trying to have with babies like i pull up oh, to I them in the strollers yeah and like dude. very few of them turn into like cogent moral uh -huh. thinking adults it's like i'm, it's, you know, I'm talking I... to a brick wall I have a 15 month old baby and you know how many fucking things she thinks is a tractor? Everything. Right. And that's what it's like talking to liberal scientists. They think everyone thinks a terrorist. They think everything is a terrorist. They think everything's anti-Semitism. And and a lot of people are doing this in this totally, I mean, they're they're full of shit. That when yeah. when someone online says, especially someone who all they talk about uh is how they are a zionist and how israel must win and all this you know these like online fucking paid has bars some of them aren't paid some of them are doing it for clout which yeah. you know congratulations or ideology or ideology but you know i i think it's uh it's a mix of 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 all these things yeah. um but you see them you know do this totally you know like this bullshit you tell me what should Israel do? Okay, military experts. And it's just like, no one is claiming to be a military expert. We're just looking at what's happening and saying this bad. And the fact that people they're, want to immediately turn it, turn everyone that they're talking to into uh, the guy, who, like you can't enter this conversation without having the exact right answer for how to solve the Middle East. And it's like- That's their big one. That's their big yeah. one. What happens after a ceasefire? And right. I say to them, if you've got your knee on yes. the sternum of a person for three years, never mind 75 years, mm -hmm. you do not get to say, well, what would happen if I got off him and obeyed the law? He might have a knife in his pocket. He might hate me. Yeah. Right. It's like, what would happen you, you if we ended slavery? That's, right. That's exactly right. You don't think yeah. whites, you don't think that you don't think that exact argument Right. was used and they had and they had evidence for it there was the nat turner slave revolt or right. whatever yes now if you're rational you understand that the nat turner slave revolt and john brown and all that is mm -hmm. a response to the thing yeah you know it's a right. you know so you end the thing and then you deal with it and you don't get to use your insecurity that is built up over these years by choosing to be an occupier which is inherently mm -hmm. an insecure and hopeless position and a traumatizing position for you actually because right. you have to be estranged from your humanity. You have yes. to, you know, and you have, you're always trying to keep on something that you know is not yours. Mm -hmm. So you either double down on that, like your character is doing, mm -hmm. or you give up the ghost and you say, you know what? We got to face the future of not knowing what's going to happen, but yeah. at least grounding it on, on principles that, that have some sanity to them. Yeah. Well, I want to show one where you kind of don't, because those are ones where you're kind of breaking character, but you have a lot of other ones where you don't break character. <laughs> yeah, um, those are the ones I get in the most trouble for. <laughs> yeah, so let's take a look at, um, uh, well, no, this is a different kind. I like this. This is like the one, it's one person playing two uh, characters. Let's look oh, at your yeah. morning video, number seven, Brad. Okay. This is a different I kind. I think Israel's going to use this tragedy as a pretext to do like another Nakba. I think we as Jews need to speak out about this man can you stop talking politics for just a moment and let me grieve where is your humanity okay okay sorry sorry you're right you're right um still grieving i'm sorry Okay, I'm ready. Yeah, Gaza's not there anymore. It's been wiped off the map. How? That's a great one. And then let's go to, um, oh, this is a very, uh, this is a, hits home. this one hits home. Let's go to uh, clip number five. Okay, so now South Africa is going to try to tell Israel that they're doing Crimes against humanity. Really, South Africa? Really? Uh, didn't you guys invent apartheid? I'm just saying, given South Africa's history of human rights abuses, uh, maybe they should sit this one out. Am I right? <laughs> On a completely unrelated note, I would like to personally thank the Reichschancellor of Germany for speaking out against uh, The Hague 
and against any kind of war crimes prosecutions. Um, Germany has always been and will continue to be the best friends of uh, the Jewish people around the world. Except for like a couple of other things. Don't worry about that other stuff. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, let's see. 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 let I know that I'm just a comedian and I usually use my platform for, you know, my little jokes, but some things are more important. And right now, I think it needs to be said that America is waging an illegal war on the Iraqi people. Hey, aren't you just a comedian? Yeah, I'm a comedian and a human being. And gay rights are human rights. Take a wee little break from being a little clown today to tell you that kids... Do not belong in cages, Trump. Didn't you used to be funny? Yeah, well, some things are more important than being funny, like trans rights. Just go to my bio and you will see a link to donate to Black Lives Matter. You'll also see a ticket link for my weekend at uh, Yuckety Yucks over in Tucson. It doesn't matter if you're a comedian <laughs> or if you're a musician, like if you have a platform, how could you not tell people about what's going on in the Ukraine? Uh, I don't think you want to know my opinion about what's happening in Israel-Palestine. I'm just a big dumbass. I'm fucking stupid. Like, when people ask me, I'm like, uh, you really want my opinion, Mr. Fucking Idiot? I'm the dumbest man in the world. And, like, I don't know about politics. Like, I'm just a guy who I slip on banana peel and go, wee. You know, you don't want to listen. People asking me, it's like, oh, okay. Well, why don't you ask? Uh, oh, why don't you ask Bozo the Clown? Because that's basically what you're doing when you're asking me. Because I'm fucking, I'm so dumb. I'm the biggest stupid. I can't think good. Uh, <clears throat> I don't want. I don't want to. I'm just, I, like, <laughs> listen, dude. <laughs> That one was literally based on something I saw from uh, another comedian that drove me up the fucking wall. Um, and yeah, I, I, I've not seen that comedian in a while in person. So uh, I, I wonder if if uh, if he ever saw it. But it, uh, yeah, straight was up. Is this a video the comedian did? Yeah, or like it was a, a video he or... like put out. Uh, and and it was just like big, uh, I'm I'm the stupidest motherfucker energy. And I'm like, I've seen you talk about other things, yeah. bro. Like, yeah, th just, you know, if you don't want to say anything because you're scared or whatever, yeah. um, that's I, like, it's understandable. Like, I don't blame anyone in the industry for being afraid for their job or whatever, you know, afraid for their prospects and not wanting to rock the boat. But don't feign dumbassery don't you know it, it just you know hide be, yeah. be be a coward but that's okay like i'm not gonna blame you for being a coward i'm scared of shit too you know just not this for some it's a, stupid fucking reason it's a classic thing where people are really um free to be virtuous and noble and brave when it takes no bravery at all right when, when you're speaking out on things no that basically the fit yeah. the liberal yeah. consensus that yes. the corporate world can get with that yeah. you know there's just no there's just no cost at all in terms of your proximity to power and privilege the minute you step out of that and you know katie your co-host on the other show who i kind of know has <laughs> faced this over and over again and so have you by association like you know, when it comes to Ukraine, if you have a different perspective or you try to, you know, fill in the blanks, it there there are consequences. And that's because the U.S. security state has decided which way it's going to go. And that's just the only way it's going to go. So this is a case. I mean, Israel is the most extreme case of yeah. thou shalt not tr trespass beyond this this place. And people know it. Yeah. And and, and I yeah. think also I there's a, a, a to be honest, there's a bit of, um, you know, there's a little bit of anti-Semitism there too, where people kind of are like, I don't want to say anything because uh, I'm scared of the Jews that run Hollywood. And I'm just like, listen, I know I'm literally in Hollywood. I'm in the entertainment industry. I'm not saying you won't face consequences. There are a bunch of fucking liberal, or there's a bunch of Zionist bullies out there who will happily try to get you blacklisted. I'm not saying that that's not there, but I'm also saying like, 
what happened to the solidarity of er earlier in the year? What happened to us against the bosses during the writer strike or during the SAG strike? Like you understand the concept of people power. And if you understand that, you understand that there's more of us than there are of them. And, and them is literally a handful of fucking Zionist assholes who run some like, you know, uh, top positions at some agencies, you know, uh, some production companies, but it's not a cabal. You, and you can, and at the end of the day, their uh, allegiance isn't to Israel uh, in general in, in Hollywood, then more so than it is to like sucking up as much fucking IP as they can so they can make another fucking Batman movie. Like that's the shit they care about. And so I don't know, a little bit of I, me is I, just I, like solidarity, guys. How about IP it? standing? IP standing for Israeli propaganda. Israeli propaganda. <laughs> yeah, well, they want to make Batman, but in Tel Aviv. <laughs> speaking of solidarity, let's take a look at this one about um, the sad breakdown in Black Jewish relations. Oh yeah. Um, which is addressing oh, this, one, this one gets me so indignant. Hey, I have a message for Black Americans posting a Palestinian flag on social media. What the hell, man? You know, Jews have been nothing but good to you. And this is how you repay us, by calling for a ceasefire in a seemingly unrelated country 6,000 miles away. Where is the loyalty? During the civil rights movement, my grandfather's his best friend marched for your civil rights. I posted a black square. I didn't have to. I got to posted some eggs Benedict. I had that very day, but I didn't because I'm a good friend. I read White Fragility. I read it and I said, yeah, white people, not me, do be like that. They do. We stood side by side with you fighting white supremacy only for you to turn around and be like ceasefire. Like, whoa, that's a pretty extreme position. Like, how do you think that makes me, a guy you didn't know was Jewish until he told you, feel? Talk to your Jewish friends. Ask them about Palestine and we will gladly educate you to the fact that you're not educated enough to talk about it. You see, Palestine is like the Confederacy. We fought a war to defeat them and their corrosive ideology, which is why when a neo-Confederate does an act of terrorism, it is justified for us to carpet bomb their entire neighborhood. It's something we do. Don't take it from me. Take it from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who once said, and I quote, Israel is good and my favorite, and they can do whatever they want. And I feel like you're betraying that memory. I know you're speaking up because silence is violence, but you know what else silence is? Golden. Silence is golden. That golden rule. Do unto others as they did unto you. Mm, it's in the Bible. We marched with you against Jim Crow. We marched with you against police brutality, and we marched with you against mass incarceration. And all we ask in return is for you to let Israel do Jim Crow police brutality and mass incarceration. Fair's fair, man. I'm sure pe did people uh, react to that. Yeah, did you lose I mean, any followers or friends over that? Uh, no, I you know I I I feel like that is one where anyone who got mad at it, who I knew, who was like a liberal Zionist, who they avoided being mad in public at that one. Right, of course. Because right. that one it would be admitting that they were that exact type of person. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, that one, I still get, um, you know, uh, a little bit of, I mean, I still get comments on it, but from people who don't realize it's satire, right. I, I've, I've had a problem uh, with, uh, especially on, on TikTok. Well, I've been kind of shadow banned on TikTok or some shit. I don't know what's happening with that. But uh, um, I, I, on Instagram, I've had to like put like uh, uh, some text in the video that says, this is satire. Right. I used to Please. have that with Twitter. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like, uh, yeah, people are, I mean, I think it's because it sounds so close to what actual Zionists say that, like, m most people, like, if you're not catching the hint of satire, then you're missing the whole thing, and you're just like, this is just That's another what happened to me. fucking yeah. ghoul. Yeah, yeah, okay. and I, I, I get, I get, like, you know, kind of being tricked by it because at this point we've seen more ridiculous things come from actual people like it's earnestly true. saying this shit yeah. and so they used to be good at it you know when i was in israel yes. i mean we were staying on a kibbutz up north called kibbutz <clears throat> tuval where we were pick, picking kiwis um and uh but we had some educational seminars and we had a two-day seminar on hasbara 
not on how to resist it, no, but on how to do it. kind of the <laughs> fundamentals of it yeah. as an important thing, you know? And um, there used to be some sophistication to it, but I think that's also because reality was easier to obscure and there were more Israel... Less social media? Less social media, but also Israel had more of... You could legitimately say that there's a peace camp. You could legitimately uh, right. say that, you know... You know, Israel in 1982, you know how many Israelis came out in Tel Aviv to protest the Lebanon war on like moral grounds? Right. It's like a hundred, hundreds of thousands of people, I right. think, were out in the street. That's the, the only war now. that they couldn't fucking spin at that time. It was the first yeah. time they were like, okay, we're doing, we're, we're, you know, going to admit we're doing this as an act of aggression. And that's it, right. And Sabra and Shatila was known about. And... Yeah. And, uh, and I think, yeah, there was a time where, you know, it wasn't just like people weren't seeing it on social media, but it was at a time where you could put your faith in the idea of like government, you know, this government is going to figure it out with that government. And, you know, the idea that the United States was going to, uh, help bring peace, like, you know, peace in the middle East was like a nineties thing. People said, yeah. um, and uh you know now it's just so clearly a ruse <laughs> that like you're not even you know they're not even lying about trying no one's even saying they're trying to get peace at yeah, this point right. israel is saying out loud what they've been doing this whole time which is like no we're gonna fucking we're gonna uh, do ethnic cleansing just call it like, something else yeah, you know yeah the, the, what, what i always whatever, noticed yeah. about israelis what i always noticed about israelis was that actually in their honest. in some ways in, in, blood, in, in person yeah well when i was there i noticed that that in their popular culture there was a lot of talk about shalom there were like mm -hmm. sentimental songs about wanting i peace mean hello kind of goodbye and peace by the way that's right people don't know yeah uh, yeah. there, but there's a song called Sherla Shalom, Song for Peace, that we used to sing. And it's this kind of utopian, we can get there someday, it's going to get there. But when you actually talk to Israelis, they didn't talk about the prospect of shalom. They talked about the prospect of sheket. And that That's word right. means quiet. Quiet. They want quiet. So peace and quiet is what they want, which means tranquility, which means just make them go away somehow. Like We don't know why they keep bothering us. All we want is quiet. And again, it's a very kind of... Um, yeah, it's it's the it's the privilege of the of the occupier to say that's right. Why are you Talk. why are you bothering us with this yeah. with these calls for freedom and justice? Yeah. yeah. Well, Matt, I know you have to put down a little future terrorist baby. <laughs> so <laughs> that's right. I'll let you go, and I'll um I'm gonna s stay on just for a little bit to read the super chats. Oh, hell yeah. um, Daniel, you can if you want to stay and riff off the super chats with me, or if you need to go too to play guitar or something i'll stick around for a bit yeah right. stick around i uh, just encourage everyone out there to uh listen to badass barra it's fun it's a comedy podcast about israeli uh, israeli propaganda uh, it's a it's uh, you know it's a, a little bit of a it's you know it's news about israel so it's gonna be sad sometimes and stuff and obviously it's horrifying what the propaganda is trying to spin but it's also uh, shit that is in much need of ridicule, and that's what we try to do. Yeah, and in whenever, fact, you know what? One of the get to that. So you have you guys have to come back again. We can actually go through some Hasbara. Oh, our yeah. our well, favorite I'm Hasbara. Yeah. Too I'm much. Of your let, let, let me just say, but before you go, Matt, let me just okay. say one of my my favorite things about the response to our song that Katie and I and, and our friends did um, is that we actually have people commenting. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Yeah, I can't really do either, but it's it's great. Like, it's comedy that you don't have to laugh at to get the value, you know. Yeah, and I feel yeah, like yeah. Bad Hasbara, like we have fun, and you're so great, and your guests are awesome. But like, I don't know. Joni Mitchell said, "Laughing and crying, you know, they're the same release." And it's like, yeah, fucking like in this in in this moment, catharsis comes in a lot of different forms, and and whatever we can do to just kind of crystallize the truth and show it and sometimes comedy and satire is the best way because truth is stranger than absurdism yeah yeah 100 percent um oh yeah. they're asking for a link to the song brad can we add that link um a description to that i think it's in the the description actually but i'll put it right now 
Well, thank you guys for for uh, thank you for having me, Katie. And yeah, thanks for great, joining. It's great really to fun. see you, and great see to you see on your you wire again. show. Yes, yes, I'll hit you up about the wire, and uh, I'll tell yeah. You how boring I thought it was at first. Yeah, well, everyone, you know, that's yeah. the thing. The wire it, it takes a moment, but it yeah. really you got to get it about six six episodes in. That's right, five or six. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Bye. All righty. So let's read through these super chats. Thank you. 155 STW for that super sticker. Thank you, Kyle Woolley, for that super sticker. Thank you, Mo Morsi. Thank you, Errol C, for gifting 10 Katie Helper memberships. Brad, we got to get on that next week. We're going to give you so many things to be happy to be a member over. Paul says, Saba is great. More power to her. Wadeworth, always so generous. Thank you for that. Gare Rendon, gifted 10 Katie Helper memberships. Thank you. Wow. Uh, Cyril Caddo, pass. Paklabar also gifted 10 Katie Alper show memberships. Wow. Adam B writes, all my respects to Katie. Thank you so much. We got a new member, Robert Vavasor. We got a new member, Gare Rendon. No, actually a new member donor donated 10 memberships. 10 more. Wow. How does that work? Does that, is, is, is that like, is that like a, a scholarship fund for know. people who can't afford yeah, to get it? I don't know, but someone was like, I just got one from you. Thanks. So I don't know how that happens, but I like it. I love it. Jennifer Gottlieb, uh, El Azari became a member. Thank you. How to combat, uh, ZX82 writes, how to combat anti-Semitism. Don't have Noah Tishby as your spokesperson. Yes. Not, not actually that far off a, a suggestion. I mean, it's just one part of it. Um, ZX82, Bad Has Bar, my new favorite podcast, subscribe. And that person must be Canadian or English or have learned English from one of those two things. Yeah, or um, Australian, any Commonwealth Australian, country. New, Ze new yeah. Zealand, right, yeah, right. Uh, favorite, yeah, favorite, favorite. Yeah, um, or colonized by them, by the Brits, yeah. Um, Heidi, Lowell, probably had a Matt video. Iron Man. Uh, oh, this was at the song. Yeah, that the lol was at the song. Super sticker from Iron Man. Thank you. Grace Slick rolling in her premature grave. Thank you. you know what that's five, about? Five. Uh, it's. A, you know what that's about, Kitty? No, I was gonna. I was trying to figure out. So, so you know the song "White Rabbit" by Jefferson Airplane, back yeah. in you know one pill makes. So that's yeah. the singer of Jefferson Airplane was uh, Grace Slick. Oh. That group became Jefferson Starship, which became Starship, which means Grace Slick oh is the woman's voice on that song. Jefferson Airplane turned into Starship. It started. It's turned. It, it turned into Jefferson Starship in the seventies, and then it became Starship in the eighties. Woman from Jefferson from Jefferson's Airplane is Starship woman. I had no idea. Nothing's gonna stop us now. And White this Rabbit one. are sung by the same woman. I had what no a career! Idea. That's insane. Really yeah. insane. Yeah. Who's the black woman named Grace something who's a that's singer? That's Grace Jones. Grace okay, Jones. that's what I was thinking of. So that's why I didn't get it. I mean, I wouldn't have gotten yeah. it anyway because I didn't know that Jefferson Airplane. Grace Jones. Okay. Um, Christine uh, Christine Bark, super sticker. Thank you for that. Dave L, super sticker. Thank you. Half Dahlia, Matt's birthright trip story is very entertaining and you got to hear it. Uh, Philip Blair writes, reminds me of Mormons recruiting so many people from North England in 1800s, entire towns depopulated, left to colonize Utah, thus Zion National Park. Which I went to for the first time this year. Beautiful place. Oh, wow. Tony Francesca writes, thank you for all your support of, for the oppressed people of the world. Thank you, Tony. Um, Jeff Aholix. Guys, the Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now video was the hardest I've laughed anything in a while in these dark times. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Choosy heretics choose carnation revolution now. Thank you. Um, insubordinate academic became a member. Thank you. Philip Blair writes, one democratic state in all historical Palestine, equal rights for all, truth and reconciliation for all, Israelis and Palestinians post-apartheid. Amen to that. Truth first, reconciliation second. Mike Priest writes, as a Brit, I'm ashamed of my nation's support for the Zionist project from the beginning and especially now. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Uh, Daniel, please bring back lyrics to go. Your discussions of culture are inspirational. Wow, look at Thank that! Thank you. If 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 I get a spare moment to do so, it would be fun. But just, that show was so time consuming for me. Kevin Mazzacco, super sticker. Thank you. Philip Blair. Philip Blair becomes a YouTube member. Thank you. Leon Mustachio, my lovely mother Claudia loves your show, Katie. Thanks, Leon, and thank you, Claudia. And I I love the name Claudia. Thanks, cousins. Writes Ulysses Jonah. 
Well, this has been a great show, really great. And we didn't even get to um, the the house bar. So you guys are going to have to come back on and we'll talk about it. We are always at your service. Thank you. And where can people find you, uh, Daniel? Um, at an undisclosed location in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, oh but if you want to find... Someone was telling us his address, literally, when I asked him that. And we were like, stop, <laughs> don't do that, please. Yeah. You know, I don't really care at this point. If they're going to find me, they're going to find me. But my innards oh, were writhing. The best response to our video, um, to the Nothing's Gonna Stop Us video, was when um, someone wrote in the comments, great work, Katie and Norman, thinking that like I had written that with Norman Finkelstein, which would have been amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway, people can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Daniel B. Mate, without the accent, obviously, M-A-T-E. If you want to check out my mental chiropractic service, go to walkwithdaniel.com. It'll tell you all about it. And my musical theater work is at danielmate.com. Yes. And uh, hopefully we'll do another collaboration. I'd love to. I mean, I, as a songwriter... I'm like a songwriter who had, doesn't write songs for the past while, and it's been a long time. And this is literally the first song I've written in like almost two years. And I was going to say earlier, I learned to write parody songs at Lefty Zionist summer camp. And back then, most of the lyrics were upholding Zionist talking points, and it felt yeah. really good to come back strong with a song that's, that's meant to expose them and take them down. So yeah. thank you for doing that with me. I mean, Norman does do some really hard, like, cutting things where he jokes on Twitter. He's like, they found, you know, I can't even make it up, but they found Netanyahu's uh, outfit, like, pajamas, and it'll be like a, a Nazi suit or something. Like, but actually clever, unlike the thing I just said. But it's very over the top. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. He, yeah. he, he's, 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 got a, he's got his own particular comic style. I don't think parody songs of 80s movie hits uh, is Are quite his wheelhouse. Genre. Yeah, exactly. No. Yeah. yeah. All righty, guys. I will see you next week. It's going to be a great show next week. I don't want to give it away, but it's going to be a great show. You're definitely going to want to become Patreon supporters to see the rest of that Max interview. Uh, he makes a bit of a presidential um, endorsement. I think it may be uh, an exclusive Katie Helper show exclusive. And uh, you can do that at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And I will see you all next week. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Daniel. Peace. Thanks, Matt. Bye, Katie. Okay, calm down. You got rivers, man. You got rivers, man.